Hey everyone, welcome back to Epic Tomorrows. Um, it's now my pleasure to talk to Sean Chamberlain um, in, a, in a half formal and half uh, spontaneous kind of way we've just established. Um, I first encountered Sean in his great book, The Transition Timeline, which builds on the work of Rob Hopkins uh, and the transition movement by specifically envisioning alternative positive futures aligned with a transition to localized, ecologically sustainable societies, um, kind of transition which many of us realize is needed and in some cases sense inevitable as a response to these times of ecological, economic and humanitarian crisis that we inhabit. Um, and with a similar perspective on localization, Sean edited the incredible tome, Lean Logic, a Dictionary for the Future and How to Survive It, um, which was written by the cultural historian and economist David Fleming, a figure of immense intellect and a personal friend of Sean's. Um, and I was really happy to get a personalised copy from you. I, I haven't delved into it as much as I should have done, but, but when I have delved into it, it's always been really rewarding. Um, so I'll put links underneath the video. Um, Sean also runs the website and blog Dark Optimism, which is a platform for his not-for-profit research, writing, activism. And I would say that Dark Optimism is a good headline, I guess, for your attitude to potential, potential civilizational collapse um, due to the global crises, as I mentioned, that we inhabit. Um, and finally, the as, which is the focus for today, I guess, although not necessarily, um, through Sterling College, based in Vermont in the USA, I've only just realised, Sean is facilitating an online course, Surviving the Future, Conversations for Our Time, which develops the concerns and concepts presented in Lean Logic, as well as in uh, Surviving the Future, which is like an introductory sort of companion vol uh, volume to Lean Logic, isn't it? And, and it's like a, a way into Lean Logic, in a way. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to say a bit about that now? Or? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, let me just finish. Uh, okay. So, the, so the, the course is offered on many levels uh, with a full intensive version known as the Deeper Dive starting on the 31st of January uh, with flexible payment options. I just want to tell my viewers for those with no or low incomes. And I'm really pleased to decide just today. I'll tell you why I decided that I really want to do it in a, in, mm. in, during the conversation. Um, but I want to do it myself and I encourage everyone else to check it out and I'll put a link just below the video. Um, so yeah, just a general conversation first of all about how the course came about um, in relation to your sort of previous work and yeah. yeah. What, so yeah, thanks for joining me today, Sean, basically as well. Oh, it's a pleasure, Matthew. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when we first met through, through Extinction Rebellion and um, yeah got good vibes from you so it's good to reconnect um so yeah i mean you mentioned um lean logic this as you say tome uh, a dictionary for the future and how to survive it which was the life's work of my late mentor david fleming um and yeah i won't say too much about it but it's it's one of the two most incredible books i've ever read and and it's in this um sort of Wikipedia-ish format um, in the in each entry, there'll be stars next for every word that has its own entry. And so it becomes this sort of choose your own adventure book um, where you, you know, follow the path of your own interests through it. Um, and David died without ever getting that published. So after his, his death, I, I brought that to publication, but in conversation with publishers at the time, they were saying, it is incredible, but it's, it's huge and it's in this strange format and I'm not sure people will quite know what to do with it. And so yes, Surviving the Future, um, is this paperback version, which basically what I did was I chose one of the potential pathways one could take through the dictionary um, and pulled that out and edited it into a, a conventional read it front to back book, which, as you say, in, in some sense um, serves as a kind of introduction. I mean, a lot of people just read Surviving the Future, but um, but it, I do, yes, intend it as something of a sort of gateway drug because people kind of get hooked on David's very compelling, warm way of writing and his rather revolutionary ideas and um and that often leads them into the main book and then off the back of that um well a few things have happened one is that a um a big fan of lean logic called matthew taylor 
um, took a course with me in, I think, 2017 at Schumacher College, um, got completely, fell madly in love with Lean Logic and decided to build it a custom website, um, which is now up at leanlogic.online. Uh, and so there you've got the entire contents of this completely for free um, and in a kind of, yeah, an interlinked website that, I mean, you know, David was writing this book before Wikipedia existed, but in many ways, his book is very suited to that online format. Um, and one of, one of the lines I really love from David's work is, do nothing that matters without consulting a conversation. And so really, as I've become the, um, the custodian of his legacy, that's always been in my head. And so in Lean Logic Online, there's a, there's a discussion thread under each entry so people can start contributing and, and making it their own and developing David's ideas. Um, and then yes, with Sterling College, started running these, these live courses. Um, and as you mentioned, there are two formats now. So there's each, each winter we run this eight week deeper dive, um, which is a, a live course, which I lead with, with amazing guests, um, off the top of my head this year, we've got Vandana Shiva and David Abram, Rob Hopkins, uh, Nate Hagens, Eve Annika, uh, oh, I'm forgetting more amazing people, Jason Hickel, um, and, uh, and that's, yeah, a, a very sort of focused, intense eight week experience for, for quite a small group to really deeply dive into some of the challenging questions of our time. And I'm fascinated here why you've decided to join. And then also, as you mentioned, there's now a, a kind of self-directed version called A Path Through Tumultuous Times, which is, um, yeah, available to take whenever you want um, and, you know, to take at your own pace, because obviously some people don't have the time to commit, you know, to giving a lot of time for eight weeks or, or that time time of year just doesn't work for them. Um, and so a lot of our, I mean, we've had hundreds of people through the live courses now and a lot of our kind of alumni have said, you know, God, there's so many people I, I, I want to lead to this experience, but you know, the timings don't work. Um, and so that's why it's only a month ago that we launched the self-directed version. Um, we've had about 25 people who are moving through it now and getting very good feedback. So that's a kind of, yeah, an alternative way. I mean, obviously it lacks some of the conversational and communal elements, but I've, I've still tried to build that in. So some of our alumni hold weekly sessions, for example, where people who are working through the self-directed course can join and talk about whatever stage of the course they're at. Um, and we have an online forum where lots of conversations happen. So again, trying to, trying to really, really get away from where I felt I was maybe 20 years ago, what I sometimes call feeling alone with the apocalypse you know, learning about what's unfolding on the planet and all my peers just not having any sense of that um, and feeling really alone with it. And so that's a big part of my motivation really with these spaces is just to have a space where people can connect and experience what it is to, to, to kind of face darkness together rather than alone, which is such a, a dominant thing in our culture that we should, you know, everything is my problem rather than our problem. And then, you know, after completing one of the courses are invited into our kind of alumni network uh, and we meet regularly and hold events and um, basically have a bunch of people around the world. We've had participants from every continent now um, yeah, yeah. who are kind of holding, mm. holding and supporting each other as they, as they work in their various communities. So that's the, the broad sense. And as you say, it's all um, we've managed to offer it all on a, on this kind of trust based pay what's right for you basis um right up to to full no cost scholarships um because as you'll know from having looked at some of david fleming's work it's it's very much about shifting away from dependence on money and much more towards dependence on on relationships in the natural world and so it would feel very it would feel very inappropriate to me if people felt unable to join for financial reasons and so i've yeah been quite careful to make sure that's not the case fantastic that's brilliant um yeah, well, before I before I sort of say why I sort of had a particular boost of enthusiasm for the course, I mean, it looked interesting. Keeping me hanging, man. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I'll say that now. Okay. Well, yeah, basically, um, I was really impressed that you've got Carly Akuno as one of mm. your... Uh, one of the names I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Um, because um, not just that he's a big leader in black grassroots organizing in, in the USA. Um, 
but also because he is, since last autumn, the racial and environmental justice coordinator for the Institute for Social Ecology, and also based in Vermont. And the Institute for Social Ecology is a uh, is is a is an institution that I've really come to um, well deeply respect. I've done a couple of their courses and I've interviewed a few of their faculty. Um, and yeah, the the kind of approach of Murray Bookchin and social ecology really resonates with me, even though I understand it's not a one size fits all thing. Also impressed that you've got Bandana Shiva and and Rob Hopkins. I don't know some of the other names to be honest, but. But yeah, this this struck me as something different from uh, um, a, a bit of a different flavor to the deep adaptation and, and, and transformative adaptation communities. How can you ensure in your community that you're part of with Surviving the Future that the kind of work you're doing isn't appropriated by, even unconsciously, by, by very sort of white supremacist narratives, including like anti-immigration and you know, turning in on ourselves and shutting off to the world. And I mean, obviously, having looked at your course in a bit more depth, I can see and certainly learning that you've got the likes of Carly Acuna on your course. I'm now much more engaged, but but still, um, I know that you resonate. You understand where I'm coming from with this. Mm, yeah. I do. I definitely can speak to this um, worry about co-option. I remember during the relatively early days of the transition towns movement um like one of the kind of principles of transition and indeed of other movements like extinction rebellion is that they are bottom up um and so um anyone who's in a community and concerned about the kind of three drives of transition which are you know climate and and energy and an economic crisis um can get together in their community and use some of the tools that transition offers and start looking at how they might reshape their community in the face of that and then they might call themselves a transition town and um as i say relatively early on uh there was a group that came together um that was uh, yeah ex coming from a coming from a fascist perspective and a decided locally right you know we are worried about these environmental issues and we'd like to come together under that banner um and this is not i think an issue that's about any particular banner or or movement um you know it's not about transition it's not about deep adaptation it's not about any of these things it's that there is a real inescapable issue and tension here so uh, in fact a couple I mean one is I for one I'm a huge fan of bottom-up organizing rather than top-down hierarchy but or and if you're a fan of bottom-up non-hierarchical organizing then you have to accept that some people are going to organize in ways you don't like <laughs> that's that's the very nature of it not being top-down it's not under your control um, and so then the question becomes well okay we accept that but at the same time do we want to you know be under the same banner or you know name as as whatever right. um and so what transition did um was say that one of the conditions for um being recognized as a transition community was um signing up to the universal human declaration of human rights for example oh, great, great. um and so but you see that in itself is a centralized decision you know that was the board of the transition network coming together and making that decision and so there is this inescapable tension between the yeah. desire to be bottom up and the desire to to control some things <laughs> um and i think also you know one of the one of the things that's really tearing our cultures apart at the moment is polarization um you know i find right and left to be quite unhelpful labels um and uh, you may have seen for example the um the film the social dilemma about how um social media are shaping people's realities with these kind of um, filter bubbles whereby people tend to see a lot of information that confirms their particular point of view and makes them feel like everyone else shares that point of view um and then when they go out into the physical world and actually interact with people they're absolutely shocked to find there are people over here with these completely reprehensible beliefs who don't believe the same thing at all and so we've lost this um sense of shared reality and if we don't have a sense of shared reality then of course 
very different approaches are going to seem to make sense to us as to how we might respond to a situation. And so to my mind, one of the key things that we can do um, to make the future a better place than it's than it's shaping up to be is really try to understand people who hold a different perspective from us. Um, I, I remember one beautiful example of this is um, in the immediate aftermath of the Brexit vote. So years before, you know, it actually all transpired and <laughs> to some extent unraveled and, and became official. But, you know, you may remember if you were in the UK at the time that um, pretty much everyone was stunned by the result uh, on, on both sides of the vote. You know, the yeah. kind of people who'd been advocating for Brexit had sort of been preparing for kind of glorious defeat as they saw it and you know well we made our stand and and the, and on the remainer side people just sort of assumed they were going to win all the major political parties back to remain you know it was a real shock and i remember walking down the street the day after and i could feel as a um you know white able-bodied english-born heterosexual male I could feel that things felt a bit less welcoming and warm, just just the vibe, just people were a bit less, more suspicious and wary. And so imagine how it felt to, you know, people who would immediately be seen as other by, you know, that that kind of central group. And often that very, you know, the people who are racist, xenophobic, whatever, um, many of whom saw that vote as um as a validation um, of, of that perspective. And one of the responses that really blew me away was there's a church in central London called St. Ethelburgers, and I'm not religious myself, but, um, but their response was to hold open listening days um, where they invited everyone from their local community to come and they would each be given some time to just speak to the assembled people about what they were feeling. And there was no responding and there was no debating it was just come and say what you're feeling right now wow and and be heard yeah and the diversity of views that were heard was you know radical you know people had completely divergent takes on what was going on whether it was good whether it was bad whether it was scary whether it was refreshing whether it was taking back control or losing it altogether but just to be in a space where all of those things could be uttered and heard respectfully I thought that was such a healing impulse. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I'm wary of in this kind of, um, you know, it's very appropriate for us to be concerned about, um, you know, racist and xenophobic views um, and to do what we can to challenge those. But it's important that we don't do that by creating even more polarization and othering by kind of looking around us for, well, you've got an unacceptable view, so you're the other side. You know, what we need to do is, is recognize that we're all people. And if we're going to have a shared, better future, then we need to work to create more togetherness rather than more polarization. I mean, you know, xenophobia, fascism, these are perspectives that are all about othering. They're all about, you know, the in-group and the out-group. Um, and for me, trying to move towards a place where we're we're all the in-group or we lose the concept of the in-group altogether is the alternative and and again there's a real there's a real tension here which is not just um you know nasty people saying unacceptable things but there's there are real difficult questions about living in a time where for example um, among many crises that i could choose the destabilization of our climate is reducing the the wealth and carrying capacity of cultures and, and indeed our planet you know it's it's harder to grow food in an unstable climate for example um you know increased droughts and flooding and wildfires do not create more abundance consequently i think it's it's understandable i don't think it's correct but i think it's understandable to think well gosh you know, there's less to go round. So I need to make sure that my whatever, my in-group, my, my family is OK. You know, my responsibility is to my family, first and foremost, or that my country is OK or that whatever in-group we're talking about 
it's okay. I'm, I don't think that's the most appropriate response, but I can understand it. I can understand that in times of scarcity, people think, well, gosh, I need to make sure my family's okay. Like that's, that's not impossible to understand. And I think if we can come to these conversations by trying really hard to understand where other people are coming from, then we've got a basis to talk about, well, then we've got a basis to talk, first of all, <laughs> rather than just, you know, pointing and shouting names and fighting in the streets. Um, and once we can talk, then we can have the difficult conversations about, wow, you know, we've got some major problems today. I mean, you know, ecological crisis, economic crisis, cultural crisis, like things are really falling apart for a lot of people. How are we going to address that together? And one response might be, well, we've just got to hunker down and we've got to, you know, stockpile food and get guns. And, and in fact, that's what the Transition Towns movement sort of grew out of as in response to was back when um, it was first developing in the kind of mid 2000s. If you looked online at people who were worried about climate change and resource depletion, almost the only response you would find was kind of survivalism. You know, it was just, well, you know, you've got to prep, you've got to stockpile food, all of that, build a bunker, like get out of the cities because it's going to be, you know, carnage. That was it. And so transition kind of developed out of some of us going, well, that isn't, that isn't how I want to respond. You know, I, I, if I had food and someone came to my gate hungry, I don't want to shoot them. <laughs> you know, that, that isn't who I am at all. And like, what if we looked at this as what can we do as a community to ameliorate these problems rather than how do I keep myself or my family safe? what kind of responses would emerge from that? And, and that was kind of the impulse that grew into the transition movement. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, would, I would caution against kind of pointing fingers and going, well, you're an eco-fascist um, because, not because fascism isn't something to avoid, but because fascism is something to avoid. And the way to avoid it is by finding common ground because that's the, that's the antithesis of othering and othering is the nature of what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, okay. You've given me a lot to think about. Um, specifically because I've recently started a, a little community on Facebook and I hope it will be more than just a Facebook group. And that's because with Extinction Rebellion, I've been kind of off and on because I've been frustrated with the movement and then I, I've kind of been a critical friend I hope to the movement um, but yeah just recently I started this group XR Europe Extinction Rebellion Europe anti-fascist uh, group and, 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 and sort of um, marrying that with refugee support as well helping groups within Extinction Rebellion in Europe um, avoid language and messaging which is co-optable by the far right. When you talk yeah. about the rise of the far right, see to me, again, I, I find right and left unhelpful terms. I think it's 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 absurd to imagine that everything that everyone thinks about how how the world should be and how society can work can be reduced to a single line and you're like, you know, somewhere on this spectrum. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just such a ridiculous concept, but it creates this again, this polarization, this sense of, well, are you right or are you left? Are you with us? Are you against us? Um, which personally, I find toxic. What I, would, what I would say, which I think is the exact same impulse that you're sharing, yeah. but the way that I would phrase that is, how do we, we need to be incredibly vigilant about when people's very understandable fears turn into, yeah, othering and, and you know, as you say, like, anti-refugee sentiment or or anti-Jewish sentiment or anti-black sentiment or anti-non-English sentiment or you know whatever it may be like I'm wary of those ideas spreading I'm not wary of those people who have those ideas spreading if you see what I mean like what I want to do is to talk to the people who have those ideas find out what the underlying motivations are which I think will be one's that I can understand and share like the desire for my family to be safe and the desire yeah. for a decent future and then talk about well maybe the best ways to achieve those aren't by separating but by working together towards that 
Um, but as soon as we start by saying, well, you're the far right and you're the enemy, uh, that conversation can't happen. Yeah, no, I, I, I do resonate with that to a degree. But, you know, when I use the term far right, it's as a descriptor. It's not a reductionist. It's not to say that these people are only far right people. It's just a descriptor mm-hmm. of certain attitudes. And a lot of such people self-identify as as hard right wing. Um, well, indeed, uh, and and I would and I would make the same argument to them. Don't self-identify that way. Yeah. Um, you know, like be a, be a rounded person, um, and acknowledge that you hold a diversity of views. That I'm sure there are some things that some of your other people who self-identify as far right think that you find mistaken or or troublesome. Um, why would we reduce our entire complex identity down to that? I mean, there are plenty of things that I find troubling about kind of classic far right perspectives. There are plenty of things I find. I would never call myself progressive because I think that progress is one of the most dangerous ideas in our culture. Um, I would never call myself right or left. Um, because I think those are quite dangerous ideas. I would never call myself a liberal because I think liberalism, well, that sounds all right. That's about freedom, right? But but again, in our culture, we're so focused on the individual that it's all become about individual freedoms. It's like my right to do whatever I want. Well, I, I don't agree with that. What I'm interested in is our collective freedom to have a future and actually focusing on individual freedoms is very often in direct tension with that. So there are very few labels that I personally would self-identify with because i again i don't i don't find that kind of generalization useful i find that in general it 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 divides people um and the only way it brings people together is kind of in opposition to those who hold a different point of view um so yeah again i mean this is this is exactly the kind of conversation that we have on the course is um as i say we've (laughs) we've literally had people from every continent we even had a scientist from antarctica um and um and that i think is incredibly valuable um to bring together that diversity of perspectives um i mean we've had you know you might have people sitting in uh the uk like us or in america for example who are like you know, well, you know, people keep talking about collapse, but, you know, when's it going to happen? Like, how far away do you think it is? And then we'd have, for example, someone from Venezuela saying, well, hello, you know, <laughs> collapse has happened here, mate. Like, my, my, my friends have lost an awful lot of weight over the last years. And, you know, it's not safe walking the streets here. And um, there's, a, there's a very powerful line um, by a, a science fiction writer who said, um, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. I've heard that. Um, yeah. Who is that? Do you know? Um, the name's gone out of my head right now. I, I quote it all the time, so I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't remember off the top of my head. It'll probably come back to me in five minutes, yeah. but you can you can always search it up on the internet. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and that's 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 deeply true. I think. Um, I mean, I think he was actually talking in quite a different context, but nonetheless, the principle I think is deeply true. And so having that diversity of of backgrounds and of politics and of um life experience um and age ranges too i mean we've had people from 20 to 90 93 i think um really helps with the kind of insularity that can lead to a lot of othering um because when you come together in a in a in a safe space with people who are very different from you um and you talk and you realize that actually you kind of want the same things you know you want your health and you want your family to be safe and you want you know the environment to be healthy and all of these things are, are, are common human impulses um then of course you know there are opponents to that um you know it's there are the, but and entrenched ones too like really uh, people who have gone so far down a certain path that it's hard to see how you could converse them to somewhere different. Um, right. But but I, I often think the real important battle for us is not against kind of the fascists out there, but against the fascists in here. Um, you know, like the, the ideas that we've absorbed from our culture or our reading or our experiences, which lead us to act in ways which are not, not aligned with reality. Like one example that's a fav- favorite for mine at the moment, because I hear it so much in kind of environmental movements like XR and deep adaptation is this idea that 
uh, you know, humanity is the virus, you know, that, that we're the ones who are going out and, and destroying everything. And again, it's really easy to understand why people would think that, because we're in the midst of an ecological mass extinction, which is undoubtedly being driven by humanity. But it's absolutely mistaken because the issue is not humanity per se. The issue is this culture. I mean, human beings have existed for hundreds of thousands of years, and yeah. it's only the past few hundred years, really, that have, have caused this problem. So as soon as we start saying humanity is the virus, then we start feeling like, well, I'm inherently bad. You know, I'm a human. You know, uh, maybe the best thing I can do for the planet is kill myself, you know. And there are people committing suicide because they believe in this in this framing. Yeah. And when we look at the state of the world and we feel a profoundly appropriate disgust and abhorrence for what's unfolding on our planet and in our culture, it's completely appropriate. But that idea encourages us to turn it inwards and go, oh, well, it's just human nature. So, you know, we're doomed and I'm part of the problem. Whereas if we correctly identify, no, it's the stories that this culture tells that are that are wrong and that are leading to then the motivation is not self-hatred then the motivation is resistance and that is far more joyous i mean it's actually a wonderful thing my one of my heroes wendell berry who's a, a american farmer and writer um from kentucky he he wrote protest that endures i think is driven by a hope more modest than that of public success the hope of preserving something in one's heart and spirit that would be destroyed by acquiescence. And for me, that is, that's my dark optimism is, you know, is, is recognizing that no matter how many things are going wrong in the world right now, no matter how many things I would desperately wish were otherwise, there is nothing about this time that stops me from living in ways that are in accordance with my heart and spirit from, from telling a story with my life that I'm proud to tell, from making the future better than it would otherwise be. And that is such a more compelling, joyous way to live than this idea of like, oh God, you know, humanity is just this virus and we're destroying everything. And, you know, we should all just, the world would be better off without us. And, and yet that's really becoming such a, a dominant concept at the moment. So for me, it's not that I say, you know, I don't know, you could call people who hold that that belief uh, that humanity is a virus virals and say, like, we need to resist the virals. But no, I don't say that. I say, well, no, we need to resist that story and we need to talk to the virals and, you know, help them to see that that story actually is false, that it, it doesn't lead where they want to go. Um, and then together we can start telling a story that that does make sense, that maybe doesn't you know, save the world, because I think it's a bit late for that in an awful lot of meaningful senses, but but does give us meaningful, purposeful, beautiful days that we can share together in, in, in making the future better than it would otherwise be. And what more has anyone ever been able to ask from life than to spend their days doing that? Right, right. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot of, there's a lot in there. A lot, a lot of that really resonates with me. Um, I'm still going to be uh, uh, awkward and... Um, good, awkward is good. Yeah, say that for me personally, I think it is important to understand, at least historically, which you didn't say wasn't the case, to at least understand historically what is meant by left and right and to avoid mistakes. So, like, yeah. for, in for instance, so you've got... I mean, it's, it's, out, it's out of studying what's meant by left and right that I've decided not to use the terms. <laughs> so, yes, I'm... Sure, sure, OK. Well, let's say you've got Carly Acuno from the Institute of Social Ecology on your course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, someone else I've interviewed from the Institute of Social Ecology is Peter, Peter Staudenmeier, who's an expert on modern German history. And I've got his book here because I've, I'm so impressed with it. And I've been studying it recently, that um, ecofascism, um, lessons, lessons from the German experience. And um, that's also with Janet Beale. Um, and he gives such, it's such a good work of scholarship in terms of um, why Weimar Germany in the 20s and how certain attitudes that were held in the 20s in Germany, including a kind of romantic agrarianism and so on, which is shared, unfortunately, by some so-called sort of progressive and so-called left-wing people in, in modern um, communities of, of adaptation or whatever to the crises we inhabit. Um, 
he shows how some of those views inadvertently, you could say inadvertently, led to the rise of fascism. Um, and for me, I don't know, maybe it's just the way my mind works, but I find it useful to, I mean, I could just substitute a different word for left and a different word for right, but... Um, well, then nothing would have changed, would it? So. But, but, but historically, like banana or apple or whatever, but historically... Well, that would, yeah, and they, they, the, the, they would, the in that case, have exactly the same problem, which would be that they would be terms of division and othering yeah that well that's that's precisely my point so, whether, whether so, they're called apple and banana or left and right the exactly, principle would be the that's, same. Pre that's precisely my point so yeah. so there is a landscape there is a historical landscape where so well, no 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 i think i think that whole frame of dividing things into two categories whether you call them left and right or apple and banana is not inherently part of history i think that's a frame through which we view history and i think it's a dangerous one okay Okay. Well, I'll I'll work on that. I'll work on that one. <laughs> well, hopefully, if it's, if you're going to join the deeper dive, then um, we will definitely talk more about this over the next couple of months because I think it's an absolutely critical conversation at this moment. Um, and as I say, it's it's not only left and right that I find unhelpful badges by any means um it's it's that i mean you know it's it's useful to categorize things um but it's also dangerous and we need to remember both sides of that yeah um would you say would you say that is it is it possible that okay forget left and right but do you think there's a useful narrative around kind of centralized power versus lo versus localized and how we need to move towards more localized uh, society yes broadly speaking um but again i recognize dangers with that um you know there are circumstances in which it's appropriate to pool resources for example i mean the ultimate in localization would be individualism um mm -hmm. and you know that's not desirable for reasons that i think a lot of people recognize so again, what what we find is a is a is a tension between two impulses. You know, the impulse towards kind of centralization and economies of scale and all of that, and the impulse towards kind of localization, which often goes along with agrarianism. And um, both of these, taken to an extreme, are very problematic. Um, and so any any time that we grab hold of one principle and say this is it, you know, this is the answer. We just need to all follow this. Well, I think. You know, we don't have to look far in history to hear the people saying those kind of words and where they end up. Um, and what, what what makes much more sense that what I, to me is wiser and by wiser, what I mean is um, a way of thinking about these things that leads more accurately to where we're trying to go um, is to hold these things in tension to say, well, yes, actually, you know, broadly, I, I would be comfortable to be described as a, as a localization advocate. You know, I, I think that's, but yeah. that's partly because at the moment our culture has gone so wildly the other way, right. you know, wildly towards globalization in a way that has never happened before. And in my opinion, will never happen again, that of course, getting back into balance looks like localization from where we are now. Um, but again, to recognize that, there are dangers in, in going in going too far that way as well. And so that we will never we will never get out of the need to engage our minds <laughs> to actually, you know, rather than just having a, a rallying cry that we can all just get behind that banner and then we know everything's fine and we never have to think about anything ever again. Like we always need to take the trouble to reflect and when somebody says well hi actually um you know my life was kind of ruined by something that i think would go under the banner of localization yeah. then you can either go shut up yeah we're localists we no, not having that get her out or you can say okay you know we, we, we want to hear that because that might actually help us to refine our approach and and see that there is a problem with it and that that needs addressing um and that for me is the critical distinction like are we rallying behind a banner or are we listening to little voices that tell us whether those are human literal voices or little niggles in our own mind that say well hang on might be missing something here need to slow down you know need to think again and i think as, as long as we do that with integrity and and love and care for those around us then 
then we won't go too far wrong. Yeah. Um, but as soon as we start saying, you know, my identity is this label, um, that way danger lies. Yeah, and also the, the so-called, uh, at least to an extent, left-right division is, is, is kind of reduced anyway, isn't it? As soon as you get more local, potentially, when people are talking to each other on a local level, it's, you know, then it's not magnified by the media into this big, you know, or even by academia or whatever. So, yeah, by media, yeah. by academia, by, by social media, all of these things. You know, there are so many people now who've got to the point where um, they're, they're so primed for this kind of tribal football team supporting response. Like, are you one of us or one of them? That, you know, even what I said earlier about how, you know, in times of catastrophic environmental breakdown, things might get more scarce. Like a lot of people go, oh, God, this sounds like anti-refugee sentiment. He's clearly one of them right wingers, like and immediately stop listening to anything I'm saying and put me in that mental category of the other side. Right. But that's not a controversial claim that environmental catastrophe leads to, you know, less abundance of food and wealth. So if, if as soon as we start assigning certain concerns to one set of people and certain concerns to another set of people, we're in big trouble. I mean, I was amazed with, um, I mean, I was a sort of climate activist back in the sort of late nineties, early two thousands. And at first in the U S this was not a partisan issue and why the hell should it be? You know, the, 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 the destabilization of our climate, why would anyone want that? Um, and it was, it was horrifically fascinating to watch it watch their political system kind of convulse until they decided, OK, uh, this party's going to be for it and this party's going to be against it, you know, and then all the all the you know media start pumping it out. And then suddenly and it, likewise with COVID, I mean, it, in, in some ways you had to admire the chutzpah of people who were so committed to, oh, well, this is all just a you know, left wing conspiracy that they would, you know, go out unprotected during a deadly virus. You know, it, it, that's how that's how powerful this thing and similarly the fact that i've just described it as a deadly virus some people will go oh well you know he's one of those lefty vaccine loving liberal you know wants to take away all our freedoms <laughs> you know like there's such this such a toxic drive towards polarization that what i'm what i'm all about encouraging is can we talk about what the issues are rather than about who we are rather than being like are you one of us or one of them can we say, well, actually, no, it's it's reasonable to be concerned about um, liberty being taken away because of fears around the virus. Like that's that's a reasonable concern. I too yeah. don't want my liberties to be taken away. It's also reasonable to be worried about your health during a pandemic. Like that's reasonable. Like, can we not have conversations where we can acknowledge both of those fears and talk not, in yeah. a nuanced <laughs> way about how we're going to balance these different concerns yeah. but instead our, our our culture seems so driven towards this you take that side and i'll take this side and we'll just yeah. shout at each other over the fence yeah true 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 yeah so for me that in in many ways i see that as the critical issue of our times because if we can't learn to communicate again then we're certainly not going to address the rise of fascism. We're certainly not going to address the mass extinction crisis. We're certainly not going to address the destabilization of our climate. We're certainly not going to assess, address systemic racism. So, you know, first we need to, yeah, stop othering each other and actually start from the point of view that you are also a human being. And so the things that you're worried about are probably also things it's reasonable to be worried about. So let's talk about it. Great, great. Okay, well, I just want to pick up a bit more on polarisation because it's quite interesting. I've been taking notes from various books about social movement building and social movements of the past and also Extinction Rebellion, take, sort of trying to work out what Extinction Rebellion is and where it came from and, 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 what, and how it's all panned out and so on and how it's going. And it's interesting because one of the tactics, and it is a tactic, of, of social movement building that, that XR has taken on is deliberate polarization in some of the messaging to, to get people to 
So either you're against, either either you want to hold the government to account on the climate crisis or you don't. And it's like, and if you read the literature that this is based on, it's it's used on one level. It reads very convincingly that this is what you need to do as a tactic is to deliberately polarise public opinion to get more support for your social movement. But on another level, and especially in light of what you've just said, it seems really highly manipulative and um, maybe not the way to go. <laughs> I, I would say definitely not the way to go. I mean, we've, yeah. we've had similar conversations around messaging in the kind of, I don't know, environmental movement very broadly, for want of a better word, for a long time. And there's a, an exceptional report called Common Cause that looked at this okay. um, and argued that there are many ways in which you can win the battle and contribute to losing the war. Um, and one is, for example, there was this huge drive, I guess about 10, 15 years ago, to what we need to do to solve climate change is um, explain to people how reducing their emissions will save them money. Um, you know, like insulating your home will cut your heating bills, you know, driving a more efficient car will cut your fuel bills. Like that's the key. Everyone wants to save money. So we'll just. And the problem with that is that it reinforces. Like it might cause some people's behavior to shift in the direction that you want it to. Some people might go, oh, well, that's going to save me money. OK, I'll do that. Um, and, and consequently would win all sorts of awards for being this successful advertising campaign or whatever. Um, but whilst doing that, it's also reinforcing the underlying frame that what really matters is money. You know, that's fundamentally the, the fundamental issue. So if an issue comes up later where actually maybe it's not profitable to try and preserve a habitable climate, well, then you've just spent all this time and effort reinforcing the frame that what matters is money. And so you've made it much harder for yourself to win the argument that, well, maybe we should still maintain a habitable climate, even though it's not profitable. Um, and this, this I mean, I, I don't know what you're referring to, but if, if that's um, a policy decision by XR, then I would say that's got the same problem. It may well, in the short term, get people riled up. And, you know, that's another sickness of our age is this idea that anything that's controversial is inherently good because lots of people will then click on it or watch it or whatever and so you get more numbers and consequently it's a success objectively um and that sounds like that same kind of thinking and while as you say it may be successful as a as a, as a tactic in the short term i think it's a deeply unhelpful strategy okay i mean yeah i mean I, you could well be right but i'm just trying to get my head around it because you know could you could you take it further, what you say, and 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 then say, oh, we should never have any social movements that rise up against gov that rise up against governments because that's too oppositional and too othering, or no, because it depends what you're opposed to. As as I said earlier, like there are absolutely ideas and actions that need resisting, not people, ideas yeah. and actions. So we're not saying we're against you as people. We're saying we absolutely will not tolerate the actions that you're taking. Um, I mean, I've done a, a, a lot of um, direct action in my time, um, you know, putting my body on the line in, in, in order to stop things happening because I considered them to be absolutely contrary to our collective future. So it's not about saying whatever you do is OK. It's, a, it's about saying you fundamentally are OK. But I think you're profoundly misguided in what you're doing right now. And if you insist on trying to do it, I will try to stop you. But when you're, you know, if, if you come round to, as I see it, recognizing that what you're doing is profoundly inappropriate, well, then we'll be friends. You know, I, I'm not saying you're evil. I'm not saying you're the bad guy. I'm just saying the ideas you have and the actions they're leading you to take seem to me to be leading somewhere that none of us want to go. And if you want to talk about that, I'd love to talk about that. And if you don't want to talk about that, well, I will try to stop you. Yeah, no, I, I think and, that, I, and I will raise a movement to try to stop you. I think I think that is the ideal perspective. But I guess the tricky thing is, how do you put that into simple slogans and messages to recruit people on the streets and so on? Um, well, I think that that can certainly be done. I mean, there are plenty of potent messages that aren't about othering. Yeah, um, many, many. Um, 
and but also i am wary of the idea that we have to simplify everything in order to get people motivated by it um i mean yeah what i want to do is is have meaningful conversations with people about the things that deeply concern them and that isn't going to be simple but it creates bonds of solidarity and and love that go far deeper than why are you here oh well i saw a nice slogan on a poster and i think the kinds of um the kinds of actions that we need to be taking collectively require that they require that we are motivated by something deeper than than a nice slogan um like i said uh, that wendell berry line like um yeah. being driven by preserving something in our heart and spirit that would be destroyed by acquiescence or another incredible story that i heard just uh in the last year or two um from the time of the vietnam war america's vietnam war um there was a, a protester standing outside the white house holding a, a burning white candle um and this reporter came up to him and she said what are you doing <laughs> Like, do you really think that standing outside the White House with a candle is going to change national policy? Like, why are you here? Uh, and he turned around and said to him, oh, said to her, oh, you've misunderstood. I'm not here to change the country. I'm here to stop the country from changing me. And I think when we come from that motivation, I, I would not be at peace with myself if I didn't stand in resistance to this then the motivation is very different because then you might succeed or you might fail in preventing the thing you're trying to prevent but the reason why you're there stands either way you know i'm here because this is who i want to be and this is what my spirit requires me to do in order to respect myself um and for me there's such a difference between actions whether they be protests or resistance or, or anything else between actions that come from a sense of desperation that come from like we must win and i just can't accept that we're losing and god we just such a different energy to i'm here to bear witness to the truth as i understand it and i will do everything i can to achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve but i'm i don't require that i win for this to be worthwhile yeah, yeah. um and that is not only in my experience a lot more inspiring but it's also doesn't lead to burnout in the same way i mean i know so many activists who are so exhausted because they've been working so hard for decades sometimes and yet their cause and the general picture just seems to be getting worse and they're just like i can't put in any more but I, I can't let it go what do i do and i i've been there i mean i've been through intense burnout myself and for me this this perspective is is what, what what changed my life. This kind of this 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 dark optimism, the recognition that okay, there are things that I can't change. There are metaphorical battles that I can't win, but I can stand for what I believe in and live for that wholeheartedly. And if I'm doing that, then I'm living the life that i choose every day and and i can't ask more than that and if it really is beyond my power to make things better in the ways that i would like to well then i just have to make my peace with that because if it's beyond my power it's beyond my power but i'm i'm going to try as hard as i can and if i fail i have to do the hard work of accepting that um and i think yeah that just feels so very different from the energy that an awful lot of of activism is coming from these days that's really interesting. It, it it brings to my mind. Um, I know it, I know there's there's more to what you said than this, but it brings to my mind the difference between Gandhian uh, kind of mor morally driven resistance and then the other kind, which is like Gene Sharp, more like strategic nonviolence or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been more on the strategic side myself, but now what you're saying really resonates so i'm gonna to have to go deeper into myself i think um, well i i offer you an eight week space to do so yeah fantastic <laughs> nice one <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so do you think it's too late for um i mean what do you think of 
I mean, I, yeah, we, we don't want to other and we don't want to sort of criticise people or movements offhand, but... Or criticise their actions. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think of where Extinction Rebellion is right now? And also, what, uh, also do you think um, there's any point in, in a kind of mass movement? Is it likely to happen? Is, is there any point in it at this at this particular moment in time, a, a mass movement of civil disobedience, whether that's just on climate or whether it's on climate and ecology or whether it's on the economic system as well, whether it's something, a much more broader sense of revolution in the streets kind of revolution. Is, is that, can, can that marry with your, the approach of the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't talk for too much longer because I need to go and continue prepping for this yeah, eight-week sure, opportunity sure, sure. that I'm offering you. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so you kind of asked two questions there, like what I think about XR and, and, and kind of is there any, any point? And um, I used to give talks to Extinction Rebellion groups and that at rebellions. Um, and I would make the point that if you asked most people what Extinction Rebellion is, they'd say it was a climate change protest. Um, and I would argue that it is neither of those things. Um, I would argue that in its original conception, uh, and I think you and I first met at the, the Declaration of Rebellion, yeah, yeah. Um, what was that? 18, no, Halloween that's... 2018, was it? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, you know, the, the original kind of concept of it was, A, I mean, look at the name, extinction, right? Like, this is about extinction. Now, you can argue whether that's, you know, some people seem to just be really focused on human extinction. Other people are, are focused on, you know, the ongoing mass extinction of life forms, our, our kin across the across the planet. Um, and if you look at what's causing that ongoing extinction, right now, climate change is by no means the leading cause. I mean, it's absolutely huge because of what we're locking in for the future. But if you look at today, um, changes in land use, so destruction of habitat. Uh, pollution. These are bigger causes of the of the extinction that's happening today, um, which is in no way to downplay climate. As I say, my, my background is climate activism, but it's just to make the point that this is not inherently, fundamentally or only about climate change. And if that's the case, which it is, then what's driving that? Because it's not carbon emissions that are driving those things. So what is, and this is where, again, I come back to the stories of our culture, like the idea of progress, the idea that this is the most advanced way of living there's ever been. You know, these cultural stories, the idea that the most important thing you can do with your days is become financially independent. Um, you know, that you have a kind of moral obligation to achieve that in your life before you think about anything else. All of these deeply embedded stories in our culture, they're what's driving extinction. So really, what are we rebelling against? If it's going to make any sense, what we're rebelling against is our culture. What we're rebelling against is our stories of what's important, not emissions. So that's the first thing about what I believe Extinction Rebellion began as and, and, and would need to be. The second thing is, you know, I said it's, it's a climate change protest, right? Well, and it's not a protest. It's a rebellion. Like the idea of Extinction Rebellion was not that we go on big marches and put pressure on the government. That The idea was that it was a collective refusal to accept the social contract like our leaders are taking us into extinction that is absolutely not where we want to go consequently we no longer accept them as our leaders consequently we are collectively going to refuse to follow orders we're going to sit down in the streets we're going to fill the jails and we're just going to refuse to be part of any society that's driving us towards extinction that's not a protest <laughs> like that's a rebellion so you know i used to give these talks because when we met at the at the declaration i was so impressed because almost everyone i spoke to that day got what I just said, like really got that. And we're like, yes, that's what we're here for. Like we are watching the death of our future and we're just not willing to stand for it anymore. But then over the years, as I participated in various Extinction Rebellion events and camps and more and more, and this is inevitable because any movement as it grows and boy did Extinction Rebellion grow, any movement as it grows, 
will to some extent become diluted it will be it will be it will start with a core group who have a very powerful impetus and a very powerful message of some kind and that will appeal to a bunch of other people and, and more and more people will coalesce but the only place those other people can come from is the wider society against which the original impetus is yeah. um and so inevitably this is not a criticism inevitably same same with transition same with occupy lots of other movements i've been involved with is that as 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 i would go to these camps and i would chat to people as we as we went about our uh, our anti-business um more and more i would be encountering people who were just coming from a perspective of um oh well what we need to do is replace fossil fuels with renewables and everything will be fine you know like because that's the message that the big green ngos have been pushing for decades now yeah. we just need to focus on decarbonizing the energy system maybe electric cars um and you'll understand based on what i just said from my point of view that just does not cut it in no. any way whatsoever it uh -huh. really doesn't um but again i'd be there and there'd be people wearing an extinction rebellion symbol and i'd be talking to them and that's what i'd be hearing and that's you know and so i would give these talks and some people would come and be like wow that's really shifted my perspective and i really get it now but to answer your question about what i think of extinction rebellion now sadly i think extinction rebellion now is a climate change protest on the whole um i mean there are still great people doing great things who fully agree with everything i've just said or indeed know far more about these things than i do but in general I think that XR has um, started fitting into um, a recognizable form. Um, yeah. You know, people are like, okay, yeah, yeah, they're doing their climate change protest thing, right? We know what that is. Um, and so I would say, at least in the UK context, which is really all I can speak to, um, that, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really excite and energize me anymore. Um, and I think, yeah, I think a lot of people feel that way. I mean, a lot of people are still deeply committed to it and I, I support them in that. Um, and that ties into my answer to your second question. You know, is there any point in all of this, which I think in a sense I already answered, like if getting out there on the street and protesting or getting arrested or, direct action or whatever you and incidentally that's another thing like to me extinction rebellion on the whole isn't direct action it often gets characterized as such like to me the definition of direct action that makes sense is acting to stop the thing you want to stop directly so you know if you're cold and you knit yourself a jumper that's direct action you know you're directly solving the problem if um someone's cutting down a tree and you tie yourself to the tree so that they can't cut it down that's direct action you're directly stopping the problem if you do things in order to put pressure on the government for the government to change policies in order to address the thing that you're doing, that's a completely yeah, yeah. reasonable strategy, but it's not direct action. Not direct action. Um, that's that's a, what you might call a political stunt or, or a campaign or whatever, which is not a criticism. Uh, it's just that to me, to, to, to call what many people, including myself, you know, I've been arrested with Extinction Rebellion, to call what many of us have done direct action to me is it's just inaccurate as i say it's not a criticism it's just to me it is inaccurate um and so yeah but is there any point in doing these things well the question to me becomes as i said well is it the truest expression of who you are and who you want to be um when when you're sitting there getting arrested or, or protesting or spending a really boring night writing a pamphlet or having a meeting that you'd really rather not be in or whatever it is that you're doing not just xr but in general would you be proud to tell that story you know if someone understood your motivations and your understandings would you be proud to say yeah yeah i was there um that for, that, that for me is the test yeah okay. um because you know that's what i want like when i when i'm I don't know if I'm lucky enough to have a deathbed. Um, that's what I. That's what I want to feel. Is I want to look back on my life and go, yeah, yeah, good work, man. <laughs> you know, you did something worth doing there, and you can be proud of that, and probably chuckle a bit, and you know, like that's that's what I want. Um, and and generally, in my experience, that looks like 
helping people and making the future a better place. Um, and so that's the question for me. If you're out there, you know, locked onto the gates of Downing Street and you feel like, wow, this is the bravest thing I've ever done and I'm really standing up for something I believe in, well then, God damn, I'm with you, like 100%. If you're there and thinking, oh my God, I've been doing this for 20 years and I don't believe in it one bit anymore, but I just don't have the heart to really reflect on it and think again about coming up with something else, then I, I think you should probably not be there and, and go and reflect, um, go and live something that you can live wholeheartedly. Um, and uh, and yeah, I know, I know people within XR who are absolutely within XR wholeheartedly and I know people who've, stepped away from XR absolutely wholeheartedly and I completely support both. Great, great. Well, that, that feels like a great place to end. Um, I know you're going to put the link below, but if anyone's just listening to this, then um, if you just put into your chosen search engine, surviving the future, Sterling College, um, you'll get there.